I'm so honored to be here because, first of all, I didn't think this many people would show up, so thank you for being here. Um, but, you know, I feel like I should have prepared something. I don't know. I, I, I knew about this for like, I don't know, four or five months, and here I am, and I'm like, what should I talk about? No, I'm just kidding. I do have stuff prepared, but I, I do want to, to give you a disclaimer. I am, first of all, I suck at PowerPoint, so I'm, just bear with me. This is not my favorite uh, type of presentation, but I think it's necessary because it gives you sort of a visual element of what I'm going to talk about today. And I want you to think about questions that you have or that you've had in your life. And maybe I can answer those, maybe I can't. So the reason that literature is on the screen is my disclaimer. I am not a scholar or an expert. I have lived in the shoes of somebody who considers themselves Muslim. And I've also lived in the shoes who is, of somebody who was born and raised in Oregon. And so I'm an Oregonian. I'm Imran. I like coffee and donuts in the morning. I'm a pretty normal guy. Um, so I just want to, that's sort of the, the preface of today's discussion is how are we going to, you know, be able to get to a point where we can understand and bridge gaps and, uh, and it's mostly tuned towards lived experience and, and less towards, uh, I'm going to read you scriptures from the Quran for an hour, right? So... Uh, that would just be awkward, right? So the Quran was originally written in Arabic, as some of you may know. And so, yeah, it would be awkward just read Arabic in here for an hour. Or it would just be awkward if I was just regurgitating stuff from the Quran. And I don't know how far that would go. So in my opinion, it was when I thought about it, I thought that it might be just make more sense to, to offer some basic principles and then give you the chance to, to ask questions. Of course, that's what I want. Um, so be ready to, to do that at, at some point and give you some anecdotal feedback. And that's, that's to really in a nutshell what we're going to try to accomplish tonight. So I did grow up 20 minutes from here in Oregon City and my parents still live there. And part of my experience with the religion was based on Oregon City. So I don't know how many people have ever been there. Okay. So uh, yeah, I mean my whole life I... I've been told to sort of, I guess, a, a story from high school. A girl comes up to me and is chatting with me, pretty casual. I know her, she knows me. And then all of a sudden she's like, you should come to our youth group um, on Wednesdays. And I, you know, Bible study. And I was like, cool, I've been to a bunch of Bible studies. It's, that's really cool, but um, you know, what, what's your motivation? And so she goes into, I think, basically she spent 10 minutes telling me that I needed to be there so she could save me and she said, and it ended with, you're going to go to hell if you don't come. Uh, so this is me, 16-year-old Imran, who's like going home. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, like, I didn't know I was going to hell. So part of it, um, my experience, I wouldn't even say part of it. I would say most of it was I was really conditioned to not talk about my religious beliefs because they were different from the norm. And Oregon City is very, very staunch. Christian following and and there's just there's a lot of churches and they they're very vocal about it which is great you should be proud of what you believe in and everything like that but but it was really about people who found out I was Muslim would really seek me out to try to challenge me and then they would try to save me so there's two things that went on so as a as a uh, growing up as a youth in Oregon City I was really conditioned to think that I was doing it wrong and I was living in a sort of closet practicing my religion. And I was like, I was like, man, I feel like I'm a normal kid. Like all I want to do is play basketball, video games, hang out with my friends. But everybody sort of uh, creates this identity for me that has a stamp on my forehead that's you're Muslim and, and uh, that's different than what we hear around here. So, and just to give you an idea, I mean, at that time, there's you know less than 20,000 people in Oregon City's population. And I want to say it's, it was like 1%. Um, you know, Asian population in, in Oregon City, and it's probably not much more now. So it was, it was not only that I practiced a different religion, it was that I just looked different, my name was different, and so all you want to do in high school, and I know maybe we have some people here that are in high school currently, but it just fit in. And so I, I really did hide my religion. So at the point I'm at now, decades later, I, I honestly am humbled to be able to share in a room, in a public area with people who actually were like wanting to be here to, to listen to some of this stuff. It really, it, it, it makes me so happy. And with that, I, I think that there's no such thing, you hear this, are there stupid questions? There's no such thing as a stupid question because 
what you've heard on the news or on TV shows or from you know whatever circle you've been in, it, it, this is a great time to ask. I think this is the reason why Bill and Zoe and I came up with some of these ideas with our DEI committee. We wanted the community to feel like they could engage in dialogue and you know it's something that you don't know and you're not comfortable talking to somebody that you just met or you don't want to get into their inner core identity workings of who they are. This is the time when you can ask those questions. So hopefully you can, there are some curiosities that can come out today um, with some of those questions. So there are five pillars. This is my sort of basics of Islam. And you may already know some of this stuff, but I'll just kind of go over it and, and talk about how I practice it and sort of what that means. So there, there's five pillars of what you're supposed to take into your heart. And then this, this begs the question, like, how does religion work? Like, what is, what is a religious person? Have you ever heard that question, are you religious? How do we really determine that, you know? So I, I don't have that answer tonight. I, I just think that it's, it's I, I don't. I mean, I think everybody has a different way why they, why they have faith or they practice or believe in a higher power or don't or spirituality or whatever you do. It's, I really think it's amazing what, what everybody does to get them through a day when you wake up in the morning till you go to sleep at night. What do you feel like is there for you tangibly or intangibly? And that's kind of what the five pillars are. It's do you, how do you want to accept those and use them in your life in any way? So having faith that there is one God, right? So there's a lot of there's a lot of dialogue around do what do Muslims believe, what God do they believe in? And there's there was three religions that, that were known to come first to humanity, right? So we know what those are, right? There's Islam, there's Christianity, and there's Judaism, not in that order, but they all are monotheistic religions, which means they all believe in one God. And it came from the same premise of that there's an almighty God that doesn't take a human form. So that's kind of what you have first to take in your and I wouldn't even say that these are in any certain order. They just exist as in like you believe in one God and you just believe there's an almighty. And I think that might be the most significantly highlighted difference between Islam and Christianity is that there is no, there is one God for Muslims and the one God is not in a human form. That's it. And it's just, it's a higher power. And so that's a little bit about that. The prayer is also something that you probably heard about. What happens with prayer? Well, there's a big long story about, and Moses is in the Quran and Abraham's in the Quran, and all these people that you've heard of, the prophets that you've heard of that are in the Bible are in the Quran. And, you know, Moses was communicating with Prophet Muhammad, and he was saying, you know, this is the deal. They, you know, we want humans to pray like 500 times a day. And he's like, there's no way that's going to happen. <laughs> and so then they, you know, they negotiated, and they were like, well, how about 100? How about 50? And he's like, how about five? Maybe five. Maybe you get lucky. Maybe five. And so what, and then people ask, okay, you pray five times a day. That's just, that's a lot. That's ridiculous. Like that's too much almost. So what does that mean? Well, you're supposed to wake up about, I would say roughly an hour before sunrise. And that's the morning prayer. The first thing you do when you wake up is you say the prayer, which I'll get to in a minute, some of the details of that. Then there's two that are in the afternoon. I'd say after the sun's kind of gone just over halfway. And that's, there's two in the afternoon. And then there's two after sunset, right? So there's your five, and those prayers can range from people can spend five minutes to 15 minutes, we'll say. But what, what's the point of it? What do you get out of it? Again, each to each their own. I mean, I don't have the answers for every person or every Muslim, but, um, but people ask me, why do you pray, Imran? And I, I am very meticulous about praying. Like, I think it's important because I don't have anything in my pockets. I've washed from head to toe, um, taken my shoes off, and I am in a area that doesn't have electronics. I mean, there's nothing that is going on in, my, in front of me, in my eyes, besides just thinking about what I'm thankful for. Or, and then you also recite Quranic verses, is um, what's how, basically how you learn prayers. There's, there's verses in the Quran that are recited throughout the day. And then you also get time where you can kind of talk about what you want, what you, you value. But so people ask, what, how, how does that work for you? Is it redundant? And it really, to me, is like you get, I get five breaks throughout the day where I'm not thinking about work or the news <laughs> or traffic or anything like that. And so that's what it does for me. Now, again, this is, goes back to my first slide. This is my first slide. It's my disclaimer that this is the way I understand and practice religious beliefs in Islam is that to me, the, the religion offers discipline. And part of the discipline is five times a day, can you put your phone down? Can you take a break from work? 
I used to work, I worked at Oregon State University for eight years. I would shut the door to my office and I would pull the blinds and I would just do prayer in the middle of the afternoon after my you know first two classes of the day. And they didn't have a dedicated prayer room on campus. So I just had to do what I could. Now, if there's not a dedicated area, you can do prayer anywhere. But typically it's nice to have um, you know, some privacy for, for focus reasons, at least in my opinion. So then there's charity, zakat. And charity is one of the pillars of the religion. If you're Muslim, you have to have an element of charity in your life. So what does that mean? To be, to be a good Muslim or to be dedicated to believe in the religion is to give back to people who need it. And there's dozens of ways that you can, you know, there's lots of different ways you can donate, right? So you can make food and give it to people. You can give clothing. You can give money. You can do acts of service, right? You can, and I could go down a big long list, but charity is key. And it means that you are taking, if you're privileged enough to have things, a roof over your head and supplemental income, you can take a percentage of that and give it back to other people who don't have it. And that's part of the existence of a Muslim, is if you are going to be successful and privileged, you better do something for humanity. And if you don't, then it's understood that God is keeping track of all that. Like, if you're greedy, greed is not really, uh, you know, recommended in our religion. It's something that is... If, if you have too much of something, you should give away what you don't absolutely need. So doing the acts of kindness, um, feeding your neighbor or going to a shelter, taking clothes because you have... It, I, I had this conversation with my wife the other day, and hopefully she didn't get mad at me for this story, but um, she said, we need more hangers. And I said, no, we don't. <laughs> Let's get rid of our clothes. And she agreed. She's like, you're right. Um, but it was, it was really about this conversation of like, that's an, <laughs> that's an indication that we, we can donate clothes, right? If you need more hangers, it's like, well, do you? Or do other people need these clothes that, that you could you know, manage to offload those? So that's another just a daily thing where you can say, how could I donate to charity if I don't have $100 to give? Give clothes to people who need them. Fasting just happened. So... Ramadan is, uh, yeah, a lot of people say it's the most important month in the religion. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that, that phrase, but what does fasting mean to a Muslim, right? It's cleansing of mind and body, right? So 11 months out of the year, I have snacks and way too much coffee and plentiful options for breakfast, lunch, dinner throughout the day, anytime I want. And I running water and electricity, hot water, all the things that I have. And I have those 12 months out of the year. But 11 months out of the year, it's almost like I don't take it for granted, but I don't notice I don't, I, that I have it and that it's such a luxury. So during fasting month, it's, it's about I can't drink water. I can't eat. Um, so like I notice that I have those things and they're a luxury. The, the hot water thing is just a little one, but it's having running water that's clean in Wilsonville, there are so many places in earth, on earth that don't have clean water or running water or functioning electric electricity. Where my parents grew up in Karachi, how many people have been to Karachi? Okay, about, it's one of the five largest cities in the world that nobody knows about, 20 million people. They don't have consistent electricity every day. Like, that's where they grew up. And my mom got, she had lanterns until eighth grade. She had a light switch finally until eighth grade, right? Just to give you an idea of where they came from. But the point I'm, the reason I'm telling that story is because I've been to those countries and there are people, many people in this world that don't have access to all of the bottom of the pyramid necessities that we do. That's what fasting means to me. I mean, it's, it's really about my dependency on coffee is ridiculous and I don't drink coffee for a month because I can't, so from sun up, Relatively speaking, from sunup till sundown, you're not drinking coffee. You're not, or sorry, you're not drinking water or anything. You're not eating. Um, if you have, you know, so if you have medical condition or you take, uh, or you, you need to, you know, it, ingest something, you don't fast, right? If you're pregnant, you don't fast. The fasting is recommended for those who are in a healthy state that can fast. Um, so, but anyway, during that time, people are like, well, how do you give up coffee? Why can't you just drink coffee? Well, at 4 a.m. or 4.30, I'm not going to pound a coffee and try to go to sleep for an hour. Um, and then at 
at 8 p.m. I'm not gonna, you know, eat my dinner and, and then be like, hey, it's a good time to drink, drink your coffee right now. So it's one of those things where actually it's, it's tough to give up, but it's good for me because it allows me to function and see what it's like throughout the, that month to not have that help that I have to, you know, wake up at 6.30 every morning with my kiddo or, um, you know, go to work and teach class and things like that. So fasting is, you are, it's meant to be, it's, it's geared towards being closer to what you take for granted and cleansing your mind and body however you think it's going to cleanse. So there's not a right or a wrong way to cleanse when you fast. It's up to each person. So anybody who does it might get something slightly different from it, right? So it's just, it's just about focus. And then the pilgrimage is something you probably heard of. Going to Mecca and paying respects is something that is highly recommended. And some people will say it's required. But it really depends on your bandwidth, like your money, your physical ability, um, the safety of travel, all those things. And so that's something that is a part of what people do later in life when they usually typically they've retired or they are, you know, have the ability to, with clear mind, go and travel to Mecca and see where the religion began. All right. So I'm going to ask you some questions. All right. We already went over. Well, do, do you know who is Allah or what is Allah? Yeah, so it's the Arabic translation of God. So if you've ever heard people throw around the word Allah and they think it's something different, it's, it's literally the Arabic word for G-O-D. That's, that's what it is. So it's, it, the God is mentioned in many different languages. That's what it is. So it's not a different God, God or statue. It's just it's the Almighty, right? Okay, so you passed that one. All right. What is halal? Okay, it is. It's similar. Did everybody hear that? Alyssa said, go ahead and say it louder. Kosher. Yeah, so it's similar to kosher. So, the yeah. So I'll get in a little bit more to what halal is. Halal is about uh, how do I put this? So from a food standpoint, when animals are killed for the purpose to eat, um, they are killed in a fashion that is done with the blessing of God. So when when a when a cow is killed for the purpose of food, a living thing is still being killed, right? So in in Islam and, I, and in Judaism as well we believe that you should kill it with the integrity of God. Like you're not just taking the life away from an animal. You're doing it with the idea that it's for food and you're blessing the death of an animal. So that's kind of what, in a, what, from a food standpoint, what halal means. So what else does halal entail? Well, it's about cleanliness. One of the big sort of, I'd, I'd say not mainstream topics of Islam is how pure and clean you should be. Um, when you do anything. So when you, you know, in Islam, you should trim your body hair to less than an inch. You should, you should always rinse and wash every day. It's expected for you to wash your body every day. You should be pure and clean before you pray. Um, those are the dynamics of the religion that are just staples of where cleanliness comes from, the way you live, the way you keep your body, the way you wash and clean your house. Um, all those things have to do with halal. So Halal is what you hear about just state of body and consumption of food. And then the other thing is, there. so shellfish is, it's again, these are gray areas and Muslims are all different around the world, do it differently. But halal also means that you shouldn't consume food that is considered dirty. Okay, so subjective, I know. So um, lobster and crab are examples of, they're, they're bottom feeders, so they're on the, the bottom of the ocean. And so it's considered that they are eating like all the stuff that falls to the bottom, which isn't like the best stuff. Um, so that's why in, in Islam, they recommend not eating crab and lobster. And then pigs are obviously it's well known that pork or you may or may not know that pork is off limits for uh, Muslims. And it's because the way that a pig sort of breeds itself and it's how it lives. And if you've ever been to a farm, you know, this kind of is a lot of stuff going on with a lot of animals. So. The logic, this is again a long time ago, was that, you know, and we don't think it's a good idea to eat pigs because they consume their own pee and poop and all that stuff. And um, so there's some things that could be <clears throat> subjective. Not everybody's the same in the way they practice that, what they consume, what they think is wrong and right. But this is kind of some of the things that you learn at an early age. <clears throat> Sorry, my allergies are horrible. The pork thing was a big deal for me when I was growing up, and that's how my religious beliefs came up a lot. That's why I mention it because a lot of times I would get offered something with bacon or pepperoni and I couldn't eat it and it led to a lot of different questions 
and a lot of judgments and people would make fun of me. Like I got made fun of all the time because I didn't eat pepperoni. And I, got, I can't tell you <clears throat> the hundreds of times that I get made fun of for not eating bacon. They, they were, you know, maybe it's a guy thing, a masculinity thing, but there were so many guys that were like, oh my gosh, I've never had bacon. Like, are you a real man? And I was just like, I think so. You know, you, know, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. My question is your um, kosher, is it the same or similar as Judaism? Yeah, it's a great question. <clears throat> I can't answer for everybody. Now, in my heart, what I think is, is everybody is a good person. So if somebody's preparing something that is, and again, I'm not speaking for all people out there that practice Islam. Um, so there's going to be definitely disagreement here. But yeah, I think it is. But I think other people would say, no, it has to be prepared by somebody who you know, was doing it specifically to be halal. Um, but that again, subjective, right? That's 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 a great question, and it's it's been discussed many times. Um, yeah, but the concept is very much the same, and so I think it is. Um, so we already talked about what is Ramadan. Um, what is the Quran? Yeah, it, it's it, very good. Yeah, I mean the Torah and the Bible are compared to the Quran, and the Quran is what was communicated. The Prophet Muhammad communicated the religion to humans, right, from God. And he, you know, the Quran is, is, is this extensive literature of all, the entire belief system and some of what I'm covering tonight, but it has very specific details about some things, right? So the one thing I want to throw out there is <laughs> there's like no, technically there's no clergy in Islam. So like, you know, in Catholicism, there's a clergy, right? There's no clergy. So one of the biggest strengths of Islam in the Quran is that it's, 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 you can interpret it to 2023. One of the biggest weaknesses could be that you're interpreting it from the way it was written a long time ago and saying, well, I think it means this, right? So the clergy can help and you know, can be advantage, disadvantage, right? So, um, but the Quran is very similar. Yeah, it's the literature of the religion. And then um, I already talked about prayer. But I like the question so far. This is a good uh, transition into this other game. <laughs> is it religion or culture? So are there cultural understandings of the way that you practice Christianity? Yeah. I mean, what are some cultural understandings of the way you practice Christianity? Like, what's cultural, do you think? Christmas. Very good. I, hey, everybody just nailed my, my quiz. You're 100% right now. All right. So... Christmas. So Christmas is a great example, right? Because is it written in the Bible that you have to have lights on your house? I don't think so. I don't know. I don't think it is. Is it written in the Bible you should have a tree? So those are cultural, right? So I think an example of culture in Islam is that it is practiced differently in different parts of the world. Okay. Now, there are some parts of the world where people are, could be clinically insane. Okay, just bear with me here. Okay, so what that means is clinically insane people who, think, who say they're Muslim and they have cultural approaches to the way they treat women. Just for example, the way they treat women. Okay, that is not written in the Quran. Okay, they're, they're, the Quran doesn't segregate women and constantly say that <clears throat> they should be, not have their driver's license. Okay, what country doesn't allow driver's licenses for women? Yeah, that's cultural. Okay, are you with me? Yeah. Okay, so the religious beliefs are, you know, they should be teach, taught and learned from the Quran. Now, there's a, such a thing, it's called the hadiths, and the hadiths is, they, they're sayings, and they're also a lot of old stories that were told and learned from people who were, existed a long time ago, who then were also in positions of leadership, who then said, hey, this is the way we want to do these things, okay? <clears throat> I'm not going to get too much of the technical aspects of culture and religion, but I think that it's worth noting that in Christianity and even in Judaism, I know I've heard stories from my Jewish friends that, oh yeah, my parents taught me this, and then the next Jewish family didn't have that understanding in their house, right? So. Um, <clears throat> It, it's just, it's worth noting that there's a lot of different things you should ask when you look at, is it culture or religion? Cultural beliefs and subsystems or systems are rituals 
in countries that exist for years and they keep doing the same thing over and over again in culturation, right? <clears throat> in other countries, they have a more freelance approach where you can practice this way or not practice this way and you're, you're good either way, right? So the, the problem, I think the issue, the overwhelming issue for cultural beliefs or traditions being communicated is that those are the popular ones that get told to us in news stories is when people are mistreated, you know, that's gonna be an easier story to write. And so, but again, culturally speaking, it to kill, to harm someone is to lose your entire, the entirety of the belief of the religion. So I don't know if you've heard that, but in the Quran it says if you harm or kill another person, you've lost your entire religious identity by doing that, right? Can you defend yourself? And I'm sure that, I know, I haven't read, I've read some of the Bible. I went to summer Bible school when I was growing up. Just to give you perspective, the daycare I went to after school and was a, a church in Oregon City. My mom had no choice. I mean, she worked full-time, my dad worked full-time. She's like, hey, this is the closest thing you can walk to and from. And so during the summer, both my parents worked full-time. I went to summer Bible school. So I, I learned a lot about just teachings in the Bible. And you know, there, there were things that you learned about, you know, an eye for an eye and things like that. And things that you were taught that were going to carry with you when you get older. But if you, if you literally carry that with you when you get older, that's gonna turn into not very good behavior, right? So, so there are things that people teach in their house or in one church or in one corner that may not, you know, be applicable to adult behavior. And, but there are people that do it in a way that, that can be extreme. So that brings me to my next slide where we hear about the extreme, I think more than we hear about the, I don't know if I want to say normal, but we hear about the extreme more than just the everyday person that pays their taxes and donates to charity and all the, the what I would say expected behaviors in, in Islam. But anyway, negativity bias is something I teach in my classes and you know, it's a, it's a tendency and perception in it. And I've done research on this. I actually did research with a colleague years ago and presented, we did a research on how the word terrorism was, was portrayed in news stories. And it just so happened that there was a, uh, a shooting in Texas on an army base at the Fort Hood army base. I don't know if you remember this, yeah. but there was one shooting by a, a Muslim guy and there was one shooting by a non-Muslim guy. And we basically did a comparative analysis of how the CNN, ABC, all your main news, cha chan news channels uh, shared that news and headlined it. And the one with the Muslim guy, it was all about his religious beliefs and his relatives and where he was from and his immigration status. And then guess what? The non-Muslim, he had mental health issues. And it, true to like what we hypothesized, that was actually what we found out when we did the study. So when was the last time you heard something good from a Muslim country? I mean, it just really doesn't happen, right? I mean, we don't hear mainstream news doesn't report like, hey, this is how much charity was donated today in this country. This is how many people they fed. This is how many people who didn't have a place to live who got taken in. Now, just, in it, just one little example. Last time I went to Karachi was in 2016. And Karachi is mostly Muslim, right? That, that, I mean, like I said, 20 million people, but most, most of them are Muslim. My cousins are driving me home or back to their house at like you know midnight, 1 a.m. And really high density of population on every corner during the day. I mean, you can't see there's just, all you can see is people everywhere. And he's like, look around. My cousin started this conversation. He's like, look around, nobody's sleeping on the street. There's not one tent, not one sleeping bag. And that was part of, he was trying, he was saying people here genuinely feel the responsibility to take somebody into their house at night to a complete stranger and put them on their couch or in the floor or somewhere to have shelter. And so that's not a story you're gonna hear about, you know, in, in America, you're not gonna hear about all the people that are doing these things daily that probably have the purpose of practicing to be a good Muslim. Yeah. I just, I don't know if you know the percentage, but do you know the percentage of Muslims, like the ones that are radicalized versus normal? Like how many are, like, is it just 20% radicalized and we just always hear about it on the news? Yeah, and I don't know the, with that, we don't hear about yeah, the good ones? no, I don't know the percentage, but I know that <laughs> yeah, I would say that, that it, it's probably pretty similar to everything you find relative to, you know, just general population, right? I mean, I would say that, and I don't know the number of Muslims that populate the world at this point, I didn't look up that statistic, but 
but it's very small. I mean, we're talking about extreme Muslims are found in any place in the world, right? So it's not just one place that you're finding them. Now it's being reported mostly in maybe Afghanistan and some countries that are popular to report. But, um, but it's, it's extremely small percentage. So I'm glad you asked that question. I don't have the statistic, but it's really about if you had 100 friends line up in this room and 95 of your friends are like, you're the best ever, I, I think you're an amazing person, I couldn't live without you, and five people are like, you suck, I hate you, I can't stand you, you're terrible. Again, that 95 to five ratio is probably what we're talking about with normal Muslims versus extreme. And that five people are the ones that everybody talks about, which is, again, what is the- worse for, you know, it, it makes up, I can't think about as they edit. It creates a bias. Yeah, of course. So 9-11 is where I was going. And I was in college when 9-11 happened. And I had people stop me on the street and on college campuses and be like, why did your people do this? You know, literally ask me a question. Like, I had something to do with 9-11. And I had to answer for it. And I did for many years. I mean, there are so many conversations where I had to answer for 9-11. And it just baffled me. And I was like, I don't know. I can't relate to people who would do that. You know, I, was, I grew up in America. And I think it's horrible. I'm really sad. Like, this is a terrible situation. But, you know, people who fly planes into buildings are, what I said, clinically insane. Like, there's no other category to put them in. They're not religion. They're not at that point. But were they labeled religious? Yes. Okay. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. What you hear about in the news with Islam is just not good. So, it's, so my whole life, it's been an uphill battle with how I, I, I try to prove my identity and say like Muslims are actually good people and here's why you know and it's been exhausting to fight that battle but that's kind of what I've been doing my entire life is to try to tell people like no we're normal we like people we want to share we we're good we don't believe in any of the stuff that the extreme people do um, because the extreme people come from a very cultural belief that they their way or the highway they're very ethnocentric they're like you live must Islam or life our way or we don't want you here. And that's a very small percentage of people in the world that do that. But those are usually people that do really bad things, unfortunately. So you beat me to it. Are there other questions about misconceptions? Go ahead, Diane. Don't you see, find that you were talking about the radicals and you were talking about what percentage in every religion, be it Christianity, be it Buddhist, be it Islam, yeah. you're gonna have the radicals. Look yes. at the John Jones, Tom Jones, and the sure. Luke Fay and the Christian, the Christian, so-called Christian. Right. Yeah. But they're going to pick on the marginalized. Yeah. yeah. From ignorance. Yeah. It it is it is similar to what happens. Oh, thanks. Can you repeat the comment? Yeah. So the comment was the, you know, are you going to have you're going to have radicals in every religion? And I believe the, that she was basically alluding to, it's, but it's not reported. So I, I'm really glad you brought this up because I also, in that same study on mass shootings, on that one mass shooting, I, I went down a different analysis, which was what mass shootings have been committed in the United States that could be considered terrorism. Well, there was actually 10 mass shootings, this is years ago, by Caucasians, and not one had been labeled a terrorist, not one. And there was actually a person who, who bombed a, an abortion clinic in, in, I think, Oklahoma. And that is the definition of terrorism. It's, it's politically motivated violence, right? And he wasn't called a terrorist. So not one news article happened to ask what his religious beliefs, beliefs were, and not one news article wanted to know where his relatives lived. But every news article I looked at that had a minority Muslim commit a crime, they said, do we need to deport their family? Are their family trying to come into our country? And are they a part of a terrorist cell? So you're right. It was it's attributed it very differently based on mainstream versus not. And if they are a part of the Christian religion, it's a status quo, right? It doesn't need to be explored. So I, yeah, that's a that's a great. Is there another question in the back? One thing I think, as far as responding to this uh, religion cultural question, is that the response would be. It's not the religion that causes it, but the extreme cultural concept would be the response. Yeah. Because right now, whenever you hear about uh, Islam or Muslims, it's automatically, well, they're doing bad things. Well, that's not true. Right. The cultural aspect of it, the extreme cultural part, the five out of a hundred, sure. are part of the response. They are. And can you, can you, would you mind getting a job in national journalism and reporting for me? <laughs> 
I would love that. Yeah. Piggyback on what she was saying about that, and actually, I was listening when you were talking about those shootings. Yes. You said Muslim and not Muslim. Yeah. To me, I, why not say like white and not white, sure. or Christian and not Christian? I mean, like right. this other person, because you are taking his religion out of what he did. Right. As well, I mean, we are doing that as a group totally. As well, which yeah. It. It is. It's tricky, and and but it's the way the the way that I've been conditioned. Because unfortunately, any time has any crime that has been committed by somebody who identifies as Muslim at some point, um, you know, it's dialogue comes up with me somewhere somehow, you know. And it it we do it in certain other areas, but it's not to the intensity it is with minority religions like Islam. That's why I put the stat on the last slide of how many Muslims are in the United States. It's pretty small compared to the you know 330 plus million people that live here. It's very small how, how many Muslims are here. So again, when you have somebody who's, who's of the very minority belief system in the United States, it's going to be magnified that much more. Yeah? Can you talk about Eid al-Adha? Say again? Eid al-Adha? I'm not sure I'm familiar. Can you elaborate? What, what are you referring to? The, the celebration. Oh, Eid? Oh, okay, Eid. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So she asked if I can, uh, can I elaborate or t kind of talk about Eid, which is the day after fasting has concluded. Am, am I understanding your question correctly? Uh, no, no, that's the, the next Eid. Slaughter, oh, slaughter the yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was, so we know about the sacrificial lamb. I mean, do we know that story kind of or the reference to it? I mean, that, that exists in... Islam as well. Do you want to? Do you want to take it? Do you know more about it than I do? Bakr Eid. Well, there are, the Eid Ramadan is the one after after yep. month of fasting. Yep. Okay. And so then there is Eid of it is called Eid al Adha or Eid al Adha is in Arabic, but like where I grew up, it says Eid al Qurban. It is because you this is you sacrifice a lamb or or or, or a Goat. Or a goat or yep. something like that, and, and share that with the, with the poor. And that's also the time that if people who go to pilgrimage, that's the time that they go to, to Mecca. Yeah. That's. If to me, it sounds like there's a lot of similarities to the Old Testament. Okay. Would you. I, I, I don't. Please repeat what. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. There's a lot of similarities to the Old Testament. Okay, let's, let's look at the similarities. This is one of the things that I wanted to talk about. What are the similarities between Christianity and Islam? I mean, there, there's a lot, right? There's, there's quite a few. Now, I, I don't know if I'm as familiar with the Old Testament. I don't know if I'm familiar with, with the Old Testament that well. But what are you, what are you referring to? Can you give me some examples? The sacrificial lamb yep. and uh, Abraham and yep. Moses. And so Jesus is in the Quran more than any other prophet is mentioned, right? So Jesus is... Believe in Jesus, but don't yes. believe he's divine. Absolutely. So That's Jesus... That's to Judaism to me. Right, yep. I mean, is it, is it fair to say that the Torah is book one? Right. What we call the... What, most people call the New Testament is book two, and the Quran is, is book three. three. Yep. So did everybody hear that? So Torah was book one, Old Testament book two, and then oh, Quran three. New Testament is book two. Sorry, New Testament. Sorry about that. No worries. Yes. You um, said that um, in the news you don't hear any positive stories out of um, uh, Muslim countries. Yes. I can think of a story that is perceived to be positive in this country and what is your perspective? I always get Iran, Iraq mixed up. Sure. The women that are taking off their headscarves and saying, yeah. we ain't doing this no more. Yeah. Which is perceived to be very positive yeah. in this country. But how is it perceived by yeah. Muslims here, people around, the, other people around the world? That's such a fantastic question. So what Charlie said was that, you know, you have Muslims that are around the country that are in, in, in sort of countries that are cultures that are being oppressed and being asked to wear certain things that you know may not be dignified and things like that and again I <laughs> this is a tough conversation first of all um, you know I've never said anything to my wife about what she wears because I just told it like she'll ask me her opinion which is a losing conversation anyway, whatever. <laughs> but, but I will yeah I will not tell her anything about I would never dare say you should or shouldn't wear that. She should wear what makes her feel good and what makes her feel like in her identity, right? So, but is that the way a lot of Muslims feel 
No. So your question is very complex. The answer to it is I can give you one perspective is that women who are protesting and having this movement are, in my opinion, fantastic. But, but it is, you're, you're, you're fighting against uh, hundreds of years of a culture that is going to be difficult, right? So I, I'm so glad you asked this question because it is portrayed as positive and then it is also portrayed as negative because they're going against their government and the government is now fighting back against them and doing horrible things to them. But let me offer you some perspective. Like, and I talked about this in my class earlier, but women being able to vote in our country, when did that happen? Yeah, so was that a big deal? Of course, and, and I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but I mean, somebody had to stand up and say women should be able to vote. I mean, I, again, I can't believe I'm saying that in the United States of America, but they were like, and then they said, no, men should just vote, right? So it's, it, this comparison- it Used to be landowners. Right, of course. So this comparison is, yeah, men own land, not women. This comparison is that in this country, that's similar, what's going on? The, the women should make decisions about what they should wear, and they have never been given that ability to do that. And now they're fighting against that and protesting and saying, no, this is wrong. We want to do this, this, and this. And it's this evolution that's occurring, again, way too late. I'm glad it's happening. I'm really sad that people are being hurt because of it. But in the United States, we've seen that happen many times with how movements occurred. For people at that time, we were like, no, this is the way it's always been done. We're just going to keep doing this rinse and repeat. Shut up. Go sit over there. But you have to, again, make a change at a certain point. Now, I also ask the question, if there is a God, an almighty, is he going to punish you because you were comfortable with what you wore? That's my philosophy on it, right? He or she. He or she, right? right? So if, if, if God is going to punish you for what you wore, that's not really the God I believe in, right? So people in this world have different approaches to way, the way God is wired and what, how God will judge, right? And the way I look at it is if you do good in life and you do it with the best of your ability and you mean well and your intentions are well, then how can you get punished for that, you know? And so the religious belief, the hardcore religious belief is like, no, the culture has always said wear this or don't wear this, so you have to do this. And they don't even use logic. They're just using cultural views, just like in America when they said, no, women can't vote. We already said you can't. It's been written and we've already determined it. No, you can't. And that wasn't using logic. That was just entrenched cultural views, right? So to me, that's the comparison you make. At that time, it was really causing, ruffling a lot of feathers in the U.S., but eventually it was a great thing. Yeah. It wasn't just women who were denied voting then. Right. Minorities. You can't compare the two. You can't compare what's happening now with women as what happened back then. It wasn't just women. Yeah, I'm more talking about sort of the, the philosophical view of what it means to that country is their cultural wiring is based on a certain ideology, right? They have an ideology of how you should behave. And here we have an ideology of how you should behave. And when that's disrupted, it's very uncomfortable. Okay, yeah, I, I might have misspoke. I apologize for that. But hey, I already told you in the first slide, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going to give it to you from my perspective. Yeah. I was just going to say that on the opposite side, well, I don't know if opposite is the right word, but I think of France. And mm -hmm. uh, if you want to wear um, a burqa or yeah. a headscarf, you should be able to, but right. in their culture now is saying you can't. Right. So right. I mean, it can go the opposite right. direction. Yeah. Well. So everybody, I don't know if you heard that, the reference was to France and they don't allow you to wear a headscarf now. And that's sort of the opposite direction. But again, it goes back to this free will conversation of right. determining what other people should do based on what your beliefs are, what, what you're comfortable with, exactly. right? Because I'm uncomfortable, I'm asking you to do this, right? Yeah. So it's the same approach. Yeah, exactly. Great, great uh, example. Yeah. I say we moved here three years ago from uh, Minnesota, and there are an awful lot of Somali um, that live there. It's the largest Somali population in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I drove public transit in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and there were a lot of Somali drivers. And um, as I was retiring, they were in the process of building a new bus garage. And in that garage, they were building a prayer room mm. for the Muslim drivers. 
and don't tell Fox News because they'll freak out. Yeah, that would be a big deal. Um, and um, around the garages, I'd see them get their prayer rugs out, and um, I would respect. That's fine. That's what. Yeah. They want to do when I walk around, go around them, and I. Yeah. I think it's great that they built a prayer room for them, I and uh, that. that's impressive. It's, yeah. It's just. Um, there are so many people in this country that would, people that watch Fox News would be going through the roof. We, we want to welcome anybody watching the news story they want. But, but I will say this. I worked at a university for eight years, and they never wanted to make that step to have that room for students or faculty, which I wish they would have, because there is a difference in a DEI workshop I do, there's a difference between acceptance and belongingness, right? So for me to be praying in my office, I was super awkward and uncomfortable for me. And to have an, an, a dedicated space like they're doing there is a different ball game, right? Because you're acknowledging that the religion exists and that people have a place to belong, just like lactation rooms. Now they're now putting those in on college campuses. Where has that been? Why is that groundbreaking, right? We could have done that so long ago but and it was like well women can do that anywhere they want no they can't it's not comfortable for them they can do it in the bathroom that's not comfortable for them right so there's a difference between acknowledgement belongingness and actually saying we support and we welcome you to do anything you want we will help you do that there's a difference between you're free to do whatever you want or we support you and we want you to belong doing that go ahead i'm wondering if like how you would respond to people who were like being negative about your beliefs, like how would you respond like right now? Yeah, so that's an, uh, also an excellent, excellent question. I think when I was in high school, I was so scared. Of, I just wanted to fit in, so I would just retreat and I would just say, yeah, you win, whatever, I'll be quiet. Um, you know, and I attended a lot of Bible studies, a lot of Bible studies, because I wanted to fit in. And, and you know, people were trying to get me to convert and they, you know, they wanted to save me. So at that time it was like, they would challenge my religion and I wouldn't fight back because I was like, I'm gonna lose. There's 20 people here and I'm one, you know? Um, so, but now I think my approach on it is you, I, I try my, so you're saying if somebody has negative understanding of my religious belief and they tell me that. Yeah, like what would you respond yeah. with? Like how would you educate them? Yeah, I think I go back to the philosophy of like our DEI committee, which is we're really here to offer information and educate and engage and you know if you want to take hopefully you take it and if you don't want to then you know I can't make you right but I would I would really just try what I tell people my philosophy is is uh, you know greet the stranger and feed your neighbor and that's really what I tell people like in a nutshell like that's that's what I think you should do is you should you should do good to somebody or acknowledge somebody respectfully and you should share when you can and that to me that philosophy is what I really try to go back to people with let's try to get rid of all the complex things you've heard in news and all the stories you heard and let's just go back to the basics like what kind of person is this you know generally speaking and that's really the route I typically go is try to create some sort of line of simplicity because the it's not going to do me any good to you know go technical with people it's just they're gonna they're, they're gonna lose me and then they're gonna go the route that they went when i was growing up which you know they're gonna i'm outnumbered right so i still think we're, we're we're going into this community in today's world that's a lot better but i think if 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 i was wondering about this the other day if we opened a mosque down the street from my my house where i live in wilsonville on the east side you know i just i again i i, I envision a day where people would be like that's really cool, you should do that. Or be like, oh my gosh, like, should we be worried? You know, what would people think, right? And I think that's where you get in the education piece. The more you get in conversations and the more you learn that these people are normal and want to be, do good for the community, the more hopefully it will catch on, right? But that's an awesome question, yeah. I was just gonna say it still, it's not just that issue, but people have, there are just some, just some people who, don't understand and they have their own personal beliefs right. when i was in college i had a, one of my professors approach me after class and say 
you need to change your major. Uh, nope. Women don't do this. Brave professor, wow. I'm sorry about that. And I, I said, well, I enjoyed it. I yeah. Put it and, and, but, but what it really came back later when I became chair of the board uh -huh. in Salem um, for my profession. Yeah. And that professor came up to me because I, was, I could have yanked his life from me. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. He said, he said, I always knew you would be great. Oh my goodness, of course, of course, yeah. Okay, I'll go to the back here. Go ahead. Yes, you. From when you were in high school to now, do you think things are getting better? Oh, great question. <laughs> when I, from when I was in high school to now, do I think things are getting better? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm here today. You know, and I, like I said, you might think I'm, I'm being cheesy or I'm just being cliche, but I, I genuinely mean that in detail. Like the, the ability to stand up here in a beautiful facility and everybody on a Thursday night came here to have a conversation. And that, that's, I mean, I, I never thought that would happen, honestly, in my lifetime. I just never thought that would happen. So I'm very much in the camp and I'm just, eternal optimist, but I think it is getting better because people have more access to information than ever, which can be bad, but I think more than ever, it allows people to not have tunnel vision and be able to at least have more than one view of a person or religion or culture. So I do truly feel like it's getting better, um, you know, with all that said, and from the days of 9-11, definitely has gotten better. For me, just as a person with my identity and my confidence or lack thereof, it's definitely gotten better. Um, but I just think that this, this, an event like this just speaks volumes to like what I feel like where our community is going. And that's why I love Wilsonville. I mean, I'm, I think it's just unique. You know, we, we're doing this and other people aren't, you know, in Oregon right now. We're here doing this. Other places are not doing this. So I think that's fantastic. Okay, in the back. Oh, who had their hand up? Go ahead. What can people in this room do to yeah. change the narrative once we leave? Yeah, join, join a newscast. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, you know, Murrow College at Washington State is, is a school of journalism and broadcasting. And it's known around the nation, and we've produced like a dozen CNN anchors, and I'm telling them, like, man, I really need to infiltrate these future anchors to speak the truth, right? No, but I think, uh, you know, I, my philosophy on DEI work, and there's a bunch of people on our committee, Erica's here, Diane's here, and I'm probably forgetting somebody, but Carla's here too, and I think that what, what our philosophy, one of our philosophies, or mine rather, is just one person at a time. You know, so today or tomorrow, the next day, you had a conversation casually with a coworker or a friend, or, and they brought something up. Now you maybe have the ability to share with them. And to me, again, one person at a time gets better or more educated. We win, right? And I remember Bill put out a uh, issue of the Boonesbury Messenger last year, and it was for Pride Month. And I had somebody come up to me, and she's a staple of our community. She's one of our politicians. And she said that this person came up to her. It was a younger person and said, I identify with the LGBTQ plus community. I feel like I belong today because of that article. That's a win. That was one person who was 15 years old or 16 years old or however old she was. And she felt more herself that day. She felt like she didn't have to hide, she felt more confident. And so to me, that's where, you know, one person has a, the ability to share accurate information or positive information. Because I, I think, I have, most of my friends are Christian. That, look where I grew up. I mean, look at my surroundings, my neighbors, and they're great. Like 90 whatever percent of them are amazing and they just, there's some Christians out there that don't believe in the right things and don't practice the right things and don't treat people right. But I don't judge that religion based on the small percentage, right? So I would never go out and say a blanket statement about certain religion being bad. I would share about the stories that I think are accurate for what I think their core beliefs are, which is they really do really good things for our society, um, just like most religions do. I think religion provides structure. So one of the things that I just wanted to mention, and I'll get you out of here soon, is um, Religion provides, for me at least, structure. And that structure is 
being able to have a system. And, and I think systems help. Like youth sports, there's studies on youth sports, and whether you like sports or not, but youth sports helps kids not drop out of school. It has diminished percentages for kids to drop out of school K through 12, okay? So structure, right? And for me, people are like, how did you, so one thing I didn't talk about today was alcohol. And in the Quran, they don't, they're, you, you're not allowed to drink. You cannot touch alcohol. And the logic in the Quran, and I'm paraphrasing here, says, if you put yourself in a position to not make intelligent decisions on your behalf or your family or loved ones or your kids, then you're doing things that are horrible and sinful and ungodly. So you shouldn't drink because what do we do when we have one Oreo or one chip? I want the whole bag and the whole box, right? Okay, it's hard to just say I want one or two. You want all of them, right? So the, I've never sit, taken a sip of alcohol in my life. And people are like, how is that possible? You know, And it's because I really believed in the structure, the philosophy that was, and I'm also a control freak. Like I've had NyQuil and <laughs> You know, the room's spinning, and I had NyQuil when I was in high school, and I was like, this is not cool. Like, I do not like what's happening. Like, I can't get up and do things that I normally do. But that was, that's, so going back to the reason for that religion exists for me, any religion, but Islam has provided structure for me to try, to, I was always a designated driver in college, and all my friends would always apologize because I would drive them to clubs and parties, and I would be drinking a cherry Coke at a party and hanging out on the couch, and they were just like, you know, they couldn't believe that I wouldn't want to drink and do what they did, but it was for me, it was about, I could fit in with a role, with a responsibility, with a job of some sort, and offer something to my circle of friends that was meaningful to me and provided structure. So to this point, I have my parents to thank, because they taught me what it means to be a good person to other people, how to make structure in your life, and how the religion provides structure to you. And to this day, I can't say I'm ultra-religious. I don't know if I am. I don't think I am, because I'm just normal. Like, I wake up every day, I'm Imran. I'm a father, and I'm a professor, and I just live a normal life. But do I practice things internally that could be different than other people? Sure. But I think that's where we get into this predicament, which is, what is religion, right? Who, how do you know if you're doing it right? I don't think we're ever going to know until a judgment day exists or something like that. But I think the the thing that I always go back to people is the structure aspect of it. Five times a day, I know that I'm going to take a minute to pause life. And I know that I'm not going to touch alcohol because I've had the structure of what I see, what I want to do, and how what clarity I want to have. And I want to be able to do things for charity based on, again, at a very early age, what I was taught by my religion. But now it makes sense, right? It would be it would be very hasty of me to be like, oh yeah, I have all this extra resources and money and I'm just gonna put it in my garage. That's not doing any good. So my religion taught me that you should share that and you should give away if you have the ability to give away. So the structure that it applied to my life and my identity was just really the most important thing that I think it, it has done. And that, that, that could be any religion. Um, so this is my sources because I'm a college professor. So if I don't give you my sources, then I will get big trouble. But those are my sources. And if you do ever want to have, you know, chat with me, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn, but you can, you know, email or get a hold of the city. And I, I love having conversations with people on ideas on how to make our community better, um, what we can do next as a DEI committee to educate, to engage, to, you know, connect with the community. Um, next year, we're going to do another speaker series, and we want to include different groups, different topics, different backgrounds have more meaningful conversations like this. So we want to hear your feedback and what you think would be great. But with that said, I want to thank everyone for coming and, and, and particularly for asking so many questions. Yeah. Having dialogues like this is why the DEI committee um, put this series together. And I think um, you mentioned them by name, but if, if you're on the DEI committee, will you just raise your hand so everyone here has a chance to acknowledge uh, the work you're doing. Yes. Um, and then, And we're also fortunate tonight to have Mary Fitzgerald and Council President Ackerball here. They raise their hands. We don't have any. So thank yeah. you uh, for allowing this work to happen. Yeah. And for our young people here. Amen. Yes, yes. All right. Thank you. Have a great night. Appreciate everybody coming.